and Matthew 2. I'd like to begin with thinking about assurance and confidence. Two words that I really love, assurance and confidence. I'd also like to begin talking about the security of the soul and the peace of mind in which God created us to live. The security of the soul and the peace of mind which God created us to live. The Bible promises that God will give us this crucial and amazing gift. But if we are honest about it, my brothers and sisters, it is a gift we so rarely have. This peace of mind, this security of the soul. We're not living it as we should. Fear not said the angels at Christmas. And then the doctors, the offices of the doctors call, and there's a problem with the test that you've just taken. They tell you to come in. They want to talk to you because there may be a serious problem based upon the test that you just took. They want to talk. Fear not, said the angels. Then the office calls and says, you know that project you've been working on so long? The one you put so much into? We've been rearranging the plans, and the whole thing may be going out the window. We may need to think in a different direction. And we may need to look at your future with the company. Fear not, you ushers may sit, says the angels. Then the other students in school let you know that there's a new kid in town that has come to this school and he is a first-rate athlete. He's a star. And he plays your position. And he's going out for your position. Fear not, says the angels. Then a loved one reaches out to you and says, this is hard to talk about, but this relationship is not working. We have come to an impasse in this relationship that was once so promising. And now the communication is dead and I don't think we're gonna make it. Fear not. Ain't that something? Yeah. The Bible has told us to fear not 365 times. That's one fear not per day. Which means that God must have been thinking that every day you wake up, you're going to be terrified and fearing and afraid of something. What better way to remind you within his holy word, 300, Brother Madry, and 65 times in this Bible, the word fear not. It said, Preach Lynch, Preach Lynch, one for every day. And you know, yet, a major university not long ago, good to see my friend Dr. Battle back there. I got to tell y'all that he's leaving pretty soon, sadly to say, but we're going to get him in here to preach before he leaves. But a major university did a poll of his students asking them to identify the number one problem they faced. And the administration expected to have answers like 
too much to do or too little time to study or things like that. But the number one problem, 75% of the students named was fear. Preach Lynch, young people, you need to wake up and hear this. It was fear. It was fear. Fear. Insecurity. Lack of self-confidence. And it was eating away at their own ability to do their best in the studies before them. Do you know why I instituted every second Sunday at both services that what you just saw Sister Edmondson get up and do? This has been going on around here for almost 30 some odd years. Because I got tired of people telling us about how bad our children were and nothing. And I knew that they were lying, but we had no other way to prove it because all they were writing about our children was bad stuff. Can I get a witness here? So I said, we are going to start having our children and grown people too to every second Sunday once a month at both services to talk about and tell us what they're doing in school and on the job and how things are going with them. This incentivizes to see folk doing good stuff. All these kids talking about A's. Look at these families over here who are so proud when their children stand up and everybody in the family making A's and A pluses. That incentivizes somebody else's family. And then I thought about it. Well, you know, we don't want to just knock every child who's making a C because if you're making an honest C, if it's a good C, then that C will get you a long way. So then we start saying, everybody. Preach Lynch. We don't stigmatize folk. We edify and incentivize folk to do their best. And to keep them from being afraid of anything is to give them the self-esteem that they need and the confidence that they need to go through this mean world because the Bible is right. Every day of the 365, the devil is going to be at you. Can I get it ready? Now, let me say this to you. The, the, the reason I'm bringing this message is because I want to suggest to you that if you look with eyes to see, the same percentage, preach lynch, the same percentage is probably present in the population as a whole. For as you begin to look with eyes that see, you will realize that you and almost everyone around you is in one or a way, another, one way or another, wrestling with fear, yeah. wrestling with insecurity, right. and wrestling with anxiety. Yeah. Right. And you know, we often put on a bro, a real bold front. Hey, man, how you doing? Oh, I got it. I got it. Everything's cool, man. You know, everything is copacetic, man. You know, all that stuff we talk about. And we try not to let it show, so we put on a bold front. But as that fear eats away at us, Brother Willis, Brother Wills, it eats away at our ability to step forward and grow into the people God most wants us to be and created us to be. I love this. God doesn't want you to be something. God created you to be something. It ain't about a proving ground here. It ain't no test involved. You were created from Jump Street to be. And be and be in is present. You're already right now great. But the problem is you don't know it. And because you don't know who you are, you are afraid of some things that's going on in the world because of the lack of self-confidence. Preach Lynch. Mr. T1. But in spite of Mr. T and the election, 
got nothing to do with who you are. You got to understand that we've had Mr. T's worse than this Mr. T. And you're looking at a man standing before you who has survived a whole lot of Mr. T's and Mr. F's and Mr. whomever. Let me say something to you. Quit being panty wasted. You know, I got a simple, a very simple idea to share, but I believe it can grow in your heart with power and blessings as we explore it. Listen, God did not create you to live in fear, and he intends for you to move beyond that fear. And we really can learn to move away from the anxiety and insecurity which we usually live in to an assurance and boldness and confidence, preach Lynch, more durable than the mountains themselves. Isn't it good to look at a mountain? Anybody ever seen a mountain? A mountain just does what a mountain does. A mountain stands. A mountain stares and a mountain looks and a mountain hovers. A mountain is majestic and a mountain is high. A mountain knows who a mountain is. I took great delight standing on San Juan Hill where Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders came over and helped with the Spanish-American War, Brother Albert say, and there I am standing there. And I told my wife, take this picture. And the, the statue was there. And you talking about as I stood beside old Teddy and think about all of the great things that Teddy did. Can I get a witness here? Thinking about Teddy as one of the four guys on Mount Rushmore. And you just don't get that earned. You has got to be somebody. So I'm standing there next to somebody who knew who he was and whose he was. I'm standing there. I said, Herb, girl, take that picture. She took that picture. And the man started explaining how they captured San Juan Hill. And, and, and the beauty of it is, is that as I stood there, it was something like oozing out of Teddy in me. Now I'm already confident in myself, but I got new confidence standing there next to somebody. I said, shucks, this, look who I'm in, this is, man. hey bud, as if me and you together here now. I'm talking to him and standing there. And then all of a sudden I noticed some. And, and, and the man explained it, and if he hadn't explained it, I never would have understood it, that, that, that we were standing there, and Teddy didn't have on a shirt. I mean, it was a shirt, but it was open, unbuttoned. And the sleeves were rolled up, and his rifle was kind of loosely strung over his shoulder. Oh, I'm looking at this big piece of granite man, and I'm standing there, and whoo, look at me, and I visualize myself with that rifle and there, yeah. Mountain conqueror. That's Damon. Look at Damon here. I said, baby, take another picture here. Because every picture, I got to put something with it. Can I get a witness? When I show it to you, I'm going to tell you a whole lot of stuff that you don't see, which would be mostly lies, but this, if you don't see it, you don't know I'm lying. Can I get a witness here? But the point I'm trying to get you to see is that the reason the statue was dressed with a guy with his clothes hanging off is that when they came to help, they miscalculated the weather. They had come from a cold climate with fur coats and all kinds of stuff. And when they got to Cuba, it was 110 degrees in the shade. They had to quickly undress all that stuff. So if you ever see the Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt Rough Rider picture, he'll be there almost half naked. Can I get a witness here? But you can see this divine, this divine, divine exception in the language that the angels use at Christmas. The expectation that we will move from fear to joy. Move from anxiety to assurance. Wherever the angels say, fear not, says Towns, and they say it all the way through the Christmas story. 
they are using the imperative form of the verb. Now watch this. Listen, 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 listen. And that means when the angel said, fear not, it's not like uh, somebody saying, uh, hurry along, come on. It's not gentle encouragement. When the angel said, fear not, it's a command. I mean, fear not, which means no reason to fear. The angel said, we got this. And because we tell you not to fear, you don't have to fear because we know there is nothing to fear. And really, Teddy Roosevelt's cousin put it beautifully in World War II. There's nothing to fear but fear itself. You've heard that across the years. Now, let me, let me tell you this. They were using, which means, don't be worried. Everything is going to be okay. Keith Everson, it's not a gentle encouragement. It's a command. It's the same verb form a general uses to tell the soldiers to attack that hill like that San Juan hill. Move! I remember San Juan hill. How many of y'all saw the movie Pork Chop Hill? Great Peck. I'm going way back here now. It's always a hill to conquer. When you wake up in the morning, you got a hill to face. When you wake up any morning, you got a mountain to face. And that mountain is already yours if you know who you are. Get out of the bed, roll over, put one foot on the ground, the other foot next to that other foot, and stand up and yawn and say, yeah. Uh, that's why I used to like Tony the Tiger. Arr. I'm a commercial freak. Because they tell a real story. Can I get a witness? You need to put your kids somewhere where your kids can get some reinforcement. I huddled this morning when the kids danced at 8 o'clock. I huddled them all together and I said, there's a Bodie here. There's a Bodie here. There's a Jeff here. There's a Dominique here. They are coming up because God keeps on sending whatever God needs to send. Nothing ever stops. And I said, whenever we see our kids, we need to huddle our kids up. And hug our kids up. People calling me on the phone. Reverend, will you come and speak? At the law school. Will you come and speak uh, over to the law school? And I told her what I was going to preach the interim president today to my people. She said, oh, you can just say some of that. Just some of that. Just two minutes of that is all we need to hear. And then it dawned on me. Then I heard that somebody wanted Obama to hook up with uh, Mr. T. And... Uh, and stand and apologize to the folk for Mr. T's behavior. Now, why in the blank? Why? Tell, tell me why in the blank that Mr. T does calling y'all all the B words and all the what you call the word, and Obama got to stand up as if Obama said something bad about you. I'm preaching here. And a whole lot of these, my white brother friends go around. Reverend, would you come? No! I mean, you going to stand up with me and apologize for what your boy said? Well, if you're not, don't call me to try to calm and ease everybody's fear. There's been an election since I saw you. There's been a no verdict since I saw you last. Want well, everybody to come, every black preacher, come and calm the community. Come calm the community. I ain't done nothing to the community. I ain't the one out here shooting and carrying guns and stuff. If anybody ought to come to the community, bring some of your folk to the community. If you make me believe you so interested in calm and peace and quiet, then get out there yourself. Them days are gone, fattening frogs for snakes. Do everything you big enough to do and then want to call the black preacher. As if, would, you, would you calm your people? My people got a right not to be calm. The way I'm calming you today is to tell you you are somebody and you don't have to fear nothing. I'm preaching here now.
It's just like when mama told us, when we were acting crazy, mama said, all right, you better stop that. We could tell by the voice and the way she said it, it was time to stop it. Did you hear what I said? It's a command. And when the angels tell you to fear not, don't be going around tipping. Fear not. Now, Reverend, tell us why that we need not fear. Well, as soon as you hear this, you may say, now, wait a minute, Reverend, wait a minute. I could use a little comfort here. I could use a little encouragement. What do you mean commanding me not to be afraid and to substitute joy for my fear? How in the world, Reverend, can I do that? How can I change my feelings, Reverend? Well, I'm glad you asked me all that. You know, it seems absolutely impossible, but the reason the angel can say it is because at Christmas, God gave the world the gift of himself in Jesus. That's it. He gave the world. I don't know whether the kids did this for you. Did they do it at 11 o'clock? They didn't do it. Well, at 8 o'clock, they did, they did a little thing for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world, God gave the world Jesus to you. He is the gift to you to keep you from being afraid. Oh, that puts a different spin on it, y'all. Yeah, now, either you have Jesus or you keep on being full of anxiety and fear. Either you get shook up about every little thing that comes along is a good indication that you really don't have Jesus like you ought to have him. I don't care what's going on on your job. And the reason I'm bringing this message today is that I see Way too many Christians in modern America believing in Jesus without ever really accepting the gifts he was born to give. Unconsciously choosing fear rather than joy. The song says, joy to the world. Why, Reverend? Because the Lord is come. Let earth Receive her king. Let me further break it down. The gist of the angel's message is quit fooling around. Accept the gifts and become the person God created you to be. To begin to understand those gifts and how they work out in our lives, we can look at the gifts that the three wise men, let me tell you what they were called. They were called the Magi, okay? They were three wise men. The Bible doesn't talk about wise men, but it talks about the Magi. That's who they are. Can I get a witness here? They came. They brought gifts. And usually a sermon on the gifts of the Magi focuses on how those gifts tell us about the identity of Christ or the functions he was to perform in his time on earth. But watch this, Keith Edmondson. In pointing out who Jesus was to be, the gifts of the wise men also point, preach Lynch, us to who he would be for us. Not just for himself. What gifts the heavenly father and what gifts the heavenly gift came to give each of us. Jesus was the heavenly gift, Marilyn Z. And what gifts did he come to give us? Preach Lynch, preach Lynch, preach Lynch. In Matthew 2, we read about the Magi, the wise men. Arriving in Bethlehem, you help me read it. They brought three gifts, and each one of those gifts is symbolic. We sing about them often, but just for a moment, think with me about what they mean in our lives. The first gift was gold. Everybody say gold. And that really doesn't need much explanation, does it? Gold was a traditional gift for a king. When a king was born or crowned or came to town, the first gift given was gold. Who is this child? Oh, yeah. This child is the king of the universe. And he was born to be king over your life. Preach, Lynch. 
Preach, Lance. That means that as he is king over your life and as you follow where he leads you, wherever this world throws at you or whatever it throws at you, you meet it not simply in your own power, but in his suddenly power and authority. I love this. I love this. I love this. This is why I love to preach like the prophets told stuff uh, because they would always say, thus saith the Lord. Don't be coming at me for talking the way I talk because what I'm saying, God told me to say it. God put it in me. That's who I am. See how it works. See how it works. See how it works. When the king, who is the child, if he's the king of the universe, then he's the king of your life. And then, as he is king over your life, he's also your leader. And you're not just playing lip service to him. It's not just you meeting this world. No, no. You are following him. So you meet the world in the power of the one who is king over the world. Oh, Lord. Oh, I love that. What's the second gift? Second gift is frankincense. Everybody say frankincense. Now, frankincense ain't nothing but incense. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Now, frankincense is incense. A lot of you get incense to make the house smell better. A lot of you girls, when the boyfriend is coming by, you put a lot of stuff and candles and sweet smell in the house. Can I get a witness? Amen. Now, the incense for you, Brother Wills, is your prayers. All your prayers. And whatever you send up to God, the fragrance of your disposition, the fragrance of your personality, the fragrance of what you have sent up cannot get to the throne room until it passes muster by the one sitting at the throne, Jesus, on the right hand of God. Priest Lynch. And so if you really want a blessing, you got to be sending up sweet stuff. And if the stuff you send up is not sweet, it's cut off right at the throne room. Then the gift, who is Jesus, steps in and looks at what you sent up and said, this ain't going to make it. And he discards it and he flips it. Can I get a witness? To make it applicable for the smell of God. You know, folk walk in here every Sunday at both services, smelling bad, getting out of the car. And let me tell you something about what smelling bad is. When we were coming up, we used to call it B.O. It's body odor. But the correct scientific phrase or name for body odor is bromonodorosis. That means whatever you have eaten or whatever you are doing, it sends off a foul smell. And when you get around folk, mm, wow, 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 wow. And a lot of folk come in here every Sunday with foul smelling odors. And the gift is here to get you clean. So that while you're in here asking the gift for your blessing, and you got a foul smell, and you still leave here with a foul smell. You know what I told 8 o'clock? I told 8 o'clock, I don't want anybody to leave out of here with a foul smell because I don't want 11 o'clock coming up here smelling foul stuff in the parking lot. And the reason so many of y'all are in here, 8 o'clock left here smelling good. Can I get a witness? Say, hey, man. Incense is frankincense. It's a sweet smell. And we should be sweet smelling to God. There's no reason why we shouldn't be sweet smelling because God intended for us to be sweet smelling. Can I get a witness? Now, that was the second gift, but don't discount the second gift. You need Jesus to be your king, but you also need him to be your priest. 
There are people listening to me right now who have been wounded so long, you've forgotten what it's like to be whole. There are people listening to me right now who've been carrying sin for so long, you've forgotten what it's like to be clean. And you don't have to live that way, y'all. Gold, frankincense, and then myrrh. And the third one is the strangest gift of all to give a baby. Myrrh is the third gift. Now, the third gift is embalming fluid. Where'd this come from, Sister Towns? I can understand the gold brother battle and the frankincense, but where'd this embalming fluid come from? Myrrh was used in embalming bodies to give it the fragrance that it needed. I'm preaching here. Because back in the day, they didn't drain all the blood out of it. They buried your whole lump and soul. And you remember in Lazarus, he said, well, you've been in there a long time, and he stinks by now. But now, if you go visit some of your loved ones, like I was at unearthing a couple of months ago, unearthing the body, shucks, the body, after all, looked just like it looked when we laid them in there. Because they put all that formaldehyde took all the blood out, took all of the propensity for them to even stink. But back in the day, that smell permeated the whole town. And so what that smell is and what that myrrh is, it has to do with sacrifice. This is the one that brings me to tears. The gold is cool. The frankincense is out of sight. But when we talk about the myrrh, here's the gift, which is the baby. Instead of the baby going and going up and it's going to be a great career and we're going to have every little baby count the toes, count the fingers. Oh, he's going to be a doctor. He looks like Uncle John and he looks, he looks like St. Mary. Oh, we're going to give him a, oh, we're going to send him to the best school. We're going to lay out all night long and so we can get him in a magnet school and we can do all that because this is our precious little baby, Mary both the same thing, but when she said, my heart is being pondered because what can this thing mean when they brought myrrh to her precious little baby, which means death, which means the baby is going to die. She wondered how long, how soon will my baby live and when will my baby die? Do you know what kind of pressure that is to be living knowing that your baby is going to die? That God had sent myrrh to your house as a gift but that myrrh was sacrifice that he not only died but he died for you and me and that's what makes the gift so astounding is because he died to solidify and cement the gift that everything was real all gold doesn't glitter all incense is not sweet smell but myrrh, you can't get around it. Once they bring the embalming fluid, that means that somebody is about to die. It took 33 years, but he died. He died after 30 years. He died. He died. And he died for you, and he died for me. Can I get a witness? Who is this child? He's the king of the universe. Who is this child? He is the one. I remember my wife, she said, let's get the tree out early because she says, the girl, I mean, my daughter's coming for Christmas, I mean, Thanksgiving, so we want to decorate the tree so they can see my tree, all right? So every year, I got to stand up there on a step ladder, weaving and bobbing <laughs> to put the last thing on the top, weaving and bobbing and she hollers I got you but she ain't really got me I can feel the hand on my back but she's looking more as to whether I got that thing straight or not than got me yeah yeah and she wondered if it's crooked can I get a witness because I know she ain't got me because every now and then she says it's crooked Moody Village she ain't paying me no attention
And one day, everywhere she goes, she bought some in Cuba. She bought Christmas presents for the family. She bought this thing. And they had one there that the tip was not a star like the star of David, but it was the sign of the cross. And now I started to say, why don't you buy that one? Because as I was preparing the sermon, I, I, I read about what that, what that myrrh meant and, and how sacrificial it was. And it meant that our gift was going to die for us. Mr. Trump, Mr. T, we ain't scared of you. And none of them rejects that you bringing back. Because we've already defeated your rejects, so I don't know why you bringing back a bunch of has-been rejects. We know who we are, and we know whose we are. We now know where we belong and to whom we belong to. Can I get a witness? Therefore, we shall not fear. Now, as I get ready to close, y'all get ready to close with me? Go back to the book of Psalms 27 and 1. Can I get a witness? Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. If you're with me, I got to know it. I can't close this thing unless you're with me. The Lord is. Read with me. The Lord is what? And what? Go ahead and whom? The Lord is what? Of what? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh. What happened? Say it again. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be what? One thing I what? And that will I look and seek after. That I may what? All the, how long? And what are you going to do when you get there? And to inquire in his temper. Y'all reading too slow. Let me go on and close this thing myself. Y'all ain't with me. Can I get a witness? For in the time of trouble, that's the time I need him. In the time when I ought to be afraid, that's the time I need him. In the time when the devil has got my back against the wall. In the time when we don't get no verdict. In the time when everything is going hocus pocus. In the time of trouble, he will what? Hide me. Where will he hide me? In his pavilion and in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall set me what? My feet shall be set upon a rock. Is a rock study? Can I get a witness? And now shall my head be what? Above my enemies, round about me, before I will offer, therefore, in his tabernacle, sacrifices of joy, not of fear. Can I get a witness? I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O oh Lord, when I cry. Anybody ever had to cry? Anybody ever had to cry? I cried last night thinking about something. Can I get a witness? I want you to hear my voice and have mercy on me. And not only have mercy, but answer me. Can I get a witness? When thou sayest, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face from me, and put not thy servant away in anger. God ain't going to cast you away. Thou hast been my help. Say amen. amen. O oh God of my salvation, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Can I get a witness? There have been a lot of folk that's come down the road that have forsaken me. But I don't worry. I know I got somebody to stand by my side and to fight my battle. He's my king, he's my priest, and he's my savior. Anybody know who I'm talking about? What's his name? 
His name is Jesus, the lily of the valley. But first of all, he was Mary's baby, born in a manger, rocked in a cradle. But I'm glad that he didn't stay a baby. He got grown, then he get grown. And when he got grown, he was tempted in all points like me. He knew how to cry because he cried himself. He felt sorry because he knew how sorry felt. Can I get a witness? He was talked about. Have you ever been talked about? He was spat upon. Anybody ever talked about you? Called you everything but a child of God. But I'm so glad that I know who I am. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. His name is Jesus. Ah! I said, ah! I said, ah! Can I get a witness? I said, ah! Then I said, teach me, Lord, and lead me in a pain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over to the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. And I almost fainted. I almost fainted. I almost slipped. I almost lost my grip. But when that happened, the Lord took me up. And I said, listen, I had to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Has it been good to you? Has it been good to you? I mean, shown up good to you. Has it brought you from out of nowhere? Has the Lord ever put food on your table? Has the Lord ever put clothes on your back? Has it been good to you? Did he ever heal your body? I said, I'm glad because if he ain't been good to you, he's shown up. Shown up been good to me. All oh, down through the years, the Lord has been good to me. And then the last verse says, wait on the Lord. Don't be scared. Don't be fearful. Wait on the Lord and be of what? Good courage. Do you know anybody that had courage? Can I call the roll? David. <laughs> had courage to go against Goliath. Abraham had courage to go out into the world. Joshua had courage to march around Jericho. Can I call the roll? And Jesus had the courage to go in the grave and stay three days and three nights. But early, early, ah! Early, early Sunday morning, get up with all power. <laughs>